Um, it is also not feasible for any member of the Planning Commission to be present at the regular location. Uh, so we will all be attending via telephone or other electronic means. We will begin this meeting today by taking a roll call. Sonia, can we have a roll call? Commissioner Anderson. Here. Commissioner Baker. Here. Commissioner DJ. Here. Commissioner Grill. Here. Commissioner Huang. Here. Commissioner Hood. Here. Commissioner McMurtry. Here. Commissioner Berryman. Here. Commissioner Presley. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Risberg. Here. Commissioner Saeed. Here. Commissioner Tagioff. Here. Commissioner Underwood. Here. Commissioner Yang. Commissioner Yang. And of course the chair. Here. And that's it. All right. So the first item on the agenda for today will be the swearing in of new commissioners, Commissioner Richard Holst, Libby Cantor, Deborah Mitchell, Stephen Moore, and Sean Thomas. I, uh, I had asked, um, the, they, they will be replacing some commissioners that we've uh, had an opportunity to work with, and that is uh, Commissioner Kathy Muchapau, Commissioner Bill Lindicky, and Commissioner Oliver. Um, I had asked to see if they could attend to just um, so that we can give them a, a thanks um, and then see if they had any last parting words for us or words of encouragement. Um, Commissioner Linda Key was unable to make it. Neither was uh, Commissioner Muchapau. She said she might try to make it, but it doesn't look like she's here. And I don't believe Commissioner Oliver is present either. Um, but if we could go on and do the swearing in. I would ask the commissioners that are being sworn in if you could turn on your camera at this time. Would you like me to go ahead? This is Sherry Moore, the city clerk. Yes, please. Okay, if I could have you all that are being sworn in, please raise your right hands, um, unmute if you're not already, but raise your right hands and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Thomas, do solemnly swear, solemnly swear. solemnly swear to support the constitutions, to support to the constitutions of the United States, of the United States, and of the state of Minnesota, and of the state of Minnesota, of the state of Minnesota. Minnesota. and to discharge faithfully, and to discharge faithfully. The duties devolving upon me. The duties, the duties upon devolving me, upon, me, upon me. As a member of the planning commission. As a member, as a member, of, member of the planning, of the planning commission, commission, commission. Of the city of St. Paul. Of the city of St. Paul, 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 Paul. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best, to the best, of, the best of my judgment, judgment and, ability. and abilities. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So congratulations to the five new commissioners. I'll um, call on you one at a time. And if you could just introduce yourself, uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, what you do for a living and what caused you to join the commission uh, before moving forward, just so that we can, uh, it's so hard with the pandemic, uh, you know, so that we can recognize who you are. So I'll start with Commissioner Holst. Hello, my name is Richard Holst. I live in the North End neighborhood of St. Paul. Um, I uh, joined the commission because I really care about the city of St. Paul and uh, care about its future and I'd like to be part of uh, the direction in some some meaningful way. Uh, I've recently been uh, involved in my community council as chair. I sit on a school board for um, a, a local charter school um, and uh, most recently was on uh, Neighborhood Star for about the last four or five years or so. Um, professionally, I work for a software company, and then as a side gig, I uh, I do some uh, rental property. So, 
Welcome, Commissioner Holst. Thank you. Commissioner Cantor. Good morning. Uh, my name is Libby Kantner. I um, live in the Summit University neighborhood of St. Paul. Um, I've lived in various places in Ward 1 my whole life, um, but here in my current host, house for the last eight years. Um, I joined the Planning Commission because similar to Rich, I, I care greatly about the city of St. Paul and I've um, dedicated my life to, to working in different capacities in the city. Um, I worked for two different city council members and then for the civilian review board for the uh, police department. So reviewing complaints against the police and um, just really excited to be here and get started. Thank you and welcome Commissioner Cantor. Commissioner Deborah Mitchell. Hello, hi, I am Dr. Deborah Mitchell and I am the Executive Director for Aurora St. Anthony Neighborhood Development Corporation. I've been there now for about nine months and so, but I've been, I live on the east side of St. Paul, but I have been part of the community and working very diligently on affordable housing and for low income people. Um, so I am very excited to be here and I truly, truly want to make a difference in our community um, for people to live and work. Thank you and welcome Commissioner Mitchell. Commissioner Stephen Moore. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Moore and I am the founder of a startup uh, called Culture Booster. Um, we're an HR tech uh, company, and I'm a resident of Dayton's Bluff. Um, typically, you will find me on the sidelines, um, but George Floyd's uh, uh, tragic murder um, has pushed me to um, just serve the community and be a part of the conversation. Um, and so I'm really grateful uh, to be here, really grateful to get to know you all, and I'm looking forward to uh, serving our beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you and wel welcome Commissioner Moore. And then uh, finally, but not least, uh, Commissioner Sean Thomas, or just Shawnee. <laughs> Hi, thank you, good morning. Uh, it's Cian, Cian Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, I've been called worse. Um, I am a resident of the east side of St. Paul, Payne Phelan uh, neighborhood. I actually went to Phelan Lake Elementary School. Uh, I went to Cleveland Middle School and graduated from Johnson High School. So I am uh, deeply embedded in this East Side community. I own a small boutique real estate brokerage, ABC Realty, and I work um, with uh, Dayton's Bluff Neighborhood Housing Services um, and Habitat and Project for Pride and Living. And so I, I kind of work in that niche of uh, nonprofit um, housing development, uh, affordable housing. I also am very active um, in my community and with the Home Ownership Center on um, taking on the um, Minnesota's home ownership gap and um, seeking ways to to close that home ownership gap. So I, I have a, a a lot of experience uh, in real estate um, and some development and the planning commission role I felt would give me a really good um, perspective to continue to develop my understanding and knowledge of that intersection of uh, real estate development and equity. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you and welcome Commissioner Thomas. Um, so and welcome to all the commissioners. Uh, we have a quite a large agenda today only because towards the end, I actually missed it, but uh, I was reminded today that we do have, um, we will be receiving a presentation uh, on the scope and authority of the commission uh, for the new commissioners. I'll just give you a brief synopsis of where we're at with that. So, uh, um, well, I'll, I'll wait till we get to, to that point to sort of describe what the presentation will be about and and the scope of what we would be doing today with that. Um, but then I'll move on to chair announcements, uh, Luis. Good morning, commission. Um, 
I actually don't have any uh, announcements, uh, but I will. I look forward to uh, the, the presentation you alluded to, Chair, uh, later in the meeting, unless you have thoughts or questions for me. And if not, thank you. All right. So the next item on the agenda is the zoning committee. Uh, before I pass it over to Commissioner Baker, I do know that all the new commissioners rec uh, received sort of the, the, all the information with regards to the items that we will be voting on today. Um, if you feel comfortable voting on them, you can go ahead and re have you reviewed all the materials. I believe you're allowed to vote on those items. If you don't feel comfortable, that's okay, or haven't had an opportunity to review the materials that Luis sent out. You, if you could just uh, ask to abstain either from any particular item or from all items when you're called upon, um, that would be fine as well. Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Appreciate it. And I just want to say also welcome to all of uh, my new fellow commissioners. Great to have you on board. Looking forward to working with you. Um, I ask that you also bear with me. Um, specifically on the uh, first zoning case. It is a little complex, but we'll get through it. I first want to start off by saying the March 23rd site plan review meeting has been canceled. And then the upcoming zoning committee uh, meeting has the following items. 1219 St. Clair Avenue rezoning from B1 local business to T3 traditional neighborhood. Um, 1001 Rainy Avenue, which is a rezoning from RT1 uh, two family residential to RM1 low density multi uh, multiple family residential. Uh, the next is 554 Broadway Street uh, rezoning from I1 light industrial to B5 central business services district. And then lastly, 603 Edmond Avenue reestablishment of a non conforming use um, as a duplex. So to provide the report out for the March 11th zoning committee, um, again, I'd like to highlight that it's somewhat complex. Um, there, the case was um, laid over multiple times. I know that I think Mr. Richardson is with us here in this meeting and he will be able to answer any questions. And I would also like to um, ask any of my zoning committee colleagues to add anything after the, my report um, if you feel like a perspective was missing. So James Lexington Apartments, um, which was old business for the zoning committee during our last meeting, uh, this is a conditional use permit for a 65 feet, eight inches building height and variances for front, rear and side yard setback for um, uh, 1074 to 1096 James Avenue uh, between Lexington Parkway and Interstate 35E. So in June 2020, the applicant applied to rezone um, the six parcels from R4 to RM2. And on July 24th, 2020, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the rezoning and requested that the site plan review for development on this property um, come to the Planning Commission uh, for a public hearing and approval. So then fast forward to February 11th, 2021, uh, the zoning committee held a public hearing on this case and decided to lay it over twice until the March 11th meeting to allow the applicant and staff uh, to work together to deal with outstanding issues uh, that came up during the zoning committee meeting. Um, there was, and I just also want to highlight that there was, we found out from the applicant and also from letters, there was much uh, community engagement done on this project from the applicant, um, but there at the time of that, um, initial zoning committee uh, meeting, there wasn't as much work done uh, behind the scenes between the applicant and the city for the city to really understand um, the project um, and any changes. So in the initial staff report, there were multiple findings that were not met. However, after talking with the applicant, changes included uh, changing the front of the building to Lexington and shifting the building to the east property line to add the front yard setback along um, area along Lexington Parkway. So ultimately, the final staff report found that three of the conditions were still not met, and I want to list them out. Um, the first one was two way, uh, which states the extent, location, and intensity of the use will be in substantial 
compliance with the St. Paul Comprehensive Plan and any applicable sub area plans which were approved by the City Council. The second one was 2C. The use will not be in detriment. Uh, the use will not be detrimental to the existing character of the development in the immediate neighborhood or endanger the public health, safety and general welfare. And then number three um, with uh, the third one, which would be 3D of uh, the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property not created by the landowner. So based on findings 2A, 2C, and 3D, staff recommended denial of the conditional use permit uh, for the building height and variances uh, for the front yard setback, but recommended approval of variances for the rear yard setback and side yard setbacks. Um, and, and I would also like to highlight that staff did um, detail reasoning, provide detailed reasoning for their denial um, in the final version of their staff report and recommendation. So the district council, district council 14 recommended approval of this project. Um, no one spoke in favor or in opposition of the application during our last public hearing. Um, there were eight letters of support and two letters in opposition of the project. Um, uh, there was much discussion between zoning committee members on this case and ultimately there was a desire by the majority of the members to support the project. Some of the committee discussion was concerning the overall building height, staff's view of the project and compliance with the comprehensive plan and more understanding of the setbacks. The zoning committee voted 5-1 to approve the project and provided language in the motion to support findings to be met for 2A, 2C, and 3D. Um, the motion to approve the project had three conditions. Uh, first, that um, final plans be approved uh, by the Planning Commission or Zoning Administrator. Um, two, units required to be affordable shall be occupied by qualifying low-income residents prior to receiving a COP, uh, uh, excuse me, a certificate of occupancy uh, for the new building or building expansion. And then three, the applicant shall apply to the owner of the north south portion of the LA right of way immediate to the east of the parcel to request a vacation of at least seven feet adjacent to the parcel to allow the building footprint to shift far enough to the east um, to meet the front. Um, setback requirements. However, if this does not happen, this was not contingent on overall approval of the project. So with that, um, Chair, there was a motion and approval by the Zoning Committee to approve um, this project. Thank you, Commissioner ba Baker. So the motion coming out of committee um, after several weeks of discussion was for approval with the three conditions, correct? That is correct. Is there any discussion on the motion or questions? All right, seeing none, Sonia, could we get a roll call? Okay, Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner DeJoy. Aye. Commissioner Grill. Yes. Commissioner Hood. Yes. Commissioner McMurtry. Yes. Commissioner Saeed. Yes. Commissioner Perryman. Oh. Commissioner Ritter. I can't hear you, Commissioner Risberg. Uh yes. Um I couldn't I couldn't hear my name. There's some background noise. Oh, somebody I'll unmute him. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Underwood? Yes. 
Commissioner Riley. Yes. Commissioner Tagioff. No. Commissioner Hong. Yes. Commissioner Cantoner. Yes. Commissioner oh, Holtz. One. Oh. Uh, I, before we finish the roll call, Luis, were I'm looking at the email. Were the materials sent to the new commissioner? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Chair, they, they were. Okay. Sorry, Sonia. Go ahead. <laughs> commissioner Holtz. Yes. Commissioner Mitchell. Abstain. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. Abstain. Commissioner Thomas. Abstain. Okay, I need to go back. I'm sorry. Commissioner Risberg, did you say yes? Yes, I did. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Thirteen three, thirteen two. Sorry, passes. I don't know how many abstentions? Three. Three. So the motion uh, is approved for the conditional use permit uh, as well as the variances. At 1074 James Avenue between Lexington Parkway and I 35E, with the three conditions. Commissioner Baker. Thanks, Chair. And I just wanted to thank um, staff, specifically Mr. Richardson, on this uh, case and working with the applicant and going back and forth. Um, all of um, department staff. Um, again, this was a somewhat of a complex uh, case and it took uh, multiple weeks, um, but um, I appreciate um, staff working with the zoning committee to get more information and to uh, work with the applicant. Uh, but moving on to new business, North End Community Center, uh, 1025 Rice Street is a conditional use permit for multi-use communi uh, community recreation center uh, with modification of conditions to permit parking in the minimum front yard and principal access to, to be from Lawson Street. Uh, variance for parking front setback. Uh, the site is owned by the City of St. Paul and used for recreational ball fields managed by uh, the Parks and Recreation Department. The ball fields have existed since 1945 and have been rezoned RT1 since 1975. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department expects the construction could take 18 months but will depend on construction financing. Uh, staff found that conditions 2A was not met. Uh, which states the proposed site for any of the uses permitted herein shall have at least one property line abutting a major thoroughfare and the site shall be so planned as to provide principal access directly to said major thoroughfare. Um, however, there was a request modification of this condition because of the undue burden on the city if the project was to meet the required front setback um, as it would impact size of the multi-purpose field and limit future programming on the site. So because of that, staff recommended approval of the application with a condition that the final plans be approved uh, by the zoning administrator. Uh, District 6 sent a letter uh, recommending approval for the project. Uh, there were no letters in support or opposition of the application and no one spoke in favor or against the application during the public hearing. Uh, the zoning committee voted 7-0 to approve um, the application. Thanks, so the motion coming out of committee is to approve the conditional use permit for multi-use community recreation center. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Sonia, can we get a roll call? Commissioner, and, uh, Commissioner Risberg. Yes. Commissioner Perryman. Yes. Commissioner Grill. Yes. Commissioner Riley. Yes. Commissioner Hood. Yes. Commissioner DeJoy. Yes. 
Mr. Baker. Yes. Mr. Taggio. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Saeed. Yes. Commissioner McMurtry. Yes. Commissioner Underwood. Yes. Commissioner Huang. Huang. Yes. Commissioner Thomas. Are you abstaining? Are you abstaining? Abstain. Commissioner Moore. Abstain. Commissioner Cat Cantoner. Yes. Commissioner Holtz. Abstain. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. Fourteen yes, zero no, and three abstentions. So the motion for a conditional use permit at 1025 Bryce Street is approved. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair. The next item is the Lexington Landing Phase 2. So this is at 915 Albion Avenue. It's a conditional use permit for a 50 feet building height. Um, this is the site of the former Riverview School that was demolished in 19, uh, excuse me, 2017. Uh, the property was rezoned from R4 to R2 in 2018. Um, this is the second phase of a senior housing development. Uh, the applicant owns the property and proposes a market rate senior rental living community with 92 units, a mix of one and two bedroom units is planned along with one guest unit. Um, staff found that all conditions were met for this application. Uh, the district council letter uh, sent a letter um, in support of the project. No one spoke in favor or against the application during the public hearing, and there were no letters in support or opposition for this application. Uh, the zoning committee voted 7-0 to approve uh, the application with one condition that final plans are approved by the zoning administrator. Great. So the motion coming out of committee is to approve the conditional use permit for a 15 foot building height at 915 Albion Avenue. Is there any discussion on the motion coming out of committee? Seeing none, Tanya, can we get a roll call? Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner DeJoy? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Commissioner Hong? Yes. Commissioner McMurtry? Yes. Commissioner Perryman? Yes. Commissioner Saeed? Yes. Commissioner Yang Tagia? Yes. Commissioner Riley? Yes. Commissioner Underwood? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yeah. Abstain. Commissioner Thomas? Abstain. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. Commissioner Holtz. Yes. Commissioner Risberg. Yes. Commissioner Cantoner. Yes. Sixteen with two abstentions. Okay. Well, that conditional use permit for a fifteen-foot building height at nine fifteen Albion is approved. Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair. This is our last item, and I just want to say thank you to the zoning committee 
members. Um, I have really enjoyed working with them. I just want to say to my fellow planning commission that um, those that are on the zoning committee are really wrestling and going back and forth with a lot of discussion on each and every one of these cases. And so I just appreciate um, their their commitment to digging into the information, reading um, staff um, packets and all of uh, the information that comes along with it. And because of that, um, the Grand Cleveland parking lot at 2060 Summit Avenue, which was a site plan review for a parking lot condition amendment, um, was voted by our zoning committee to be laid over. Um, this application um, will be moved to our next zoning committee meeting. And um, the main reason being is uh, the zoning committee members wanted more information and history about the site uh, before they made an important vote. So we are planning to lay that um, application over to our next zoning committee meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. And I believe you said that's the last one, correct? That is correct. All right. Moving on to the next item on the agenda. Well, uh, before we move on, is there any question on the Grand Cleveland parking lot and the decision to lay it over? All right, moving on to the next item on the agenda is the Comp Plan and Neighborhood Planning Committee. Commissioner Grill. All right, um, we have two items today. Um, the Homeless Services Zoning Study, which is to initiate the study and release proposed code amendments for public review and set a public hearing for April 30th. Um, the staff member on this is um, Bill Dermody. Um, Bill, do you have a presentation on the Homeless Zoning Study? Uh, just a brief one. Okay, uh, so, so we'll go to Bill. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Bill Dermody, uh, planner, for those who I haven't met yet, because it seems like we have a lot of new folks, hello and, and welcome to the commission. Um, normally I would try to catch you before a meeting and and uh, say hello and introduce myself, but you know, COVID <laughs> makes everything a little more awkward and uh, difficult. Um, today we've got the homeless services zoning study on your agenda and this was, um, the need for this zoning study came up really rather quickly in response to a specific situation, but this would have broader implications. It's a citywide um, study. There is a temporary situation at a former fire station um, on West 7th that through a an action by the city council affirming a mayor's um, emergency ordinance, there, there is a uh, daytime services for for homeless people um, occurring in that in that fire facility, uh, but there is no actual uh, authorization in the zoning code for this. And since the uh, COVID emergency will end at some point in time, um, but this particular use has a desire to continue on longer, that's the the impetus for this study. Um, this would allow daytime services to to homeless folks um, without having it be accessory to an overnight shelter, which is how it usually occurs in the city and, and elsewhere, um, or emergency housing, which are, are, are two definitions for slightly different uses in our code that basically provide shelter to homeless people. Um, the you know, the, the full set of recommendations is, is in the code, but the, the base of it is to allow these daytime services um, to homeless folks with uh, just slight uh, conditions on them that, uh, that they'd be located within a half mile of an overnight shelter or uh, emergency housing of a similar scale so that you know, there, so that these services are walkable, um, so that we are not creating some sort of transportation problem with the locating of these types of facilities. Uh, but clearly they are necessary and clearly they are supported by the city's comprehensive plan um, and all the efforts that the city is making to improve the situation for, for the unsheltered and um, not permanently sheltered homeless folks in the city. So, um, 
I'd be glad to take any questions that you have. The request here is that you release the study for public review and and set a, a public hearing for April 30th. Thank you, Mr. Germany. So I would need a motion uh, to initiate the study and release the proposed code amendments for public review and set a public hearing for April 30th. Commissioner Go, would you be OK making that motion? Yep. Uh, is uh, there a second? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> is there a second on the motion? Commissioner DeJoy, second. Motion made by Commissioner Grill, seconded by Commissioner DeJoy to uh, initiate the study on the homeless services uh, zoning. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Sonia, could we get a roll call? Commissioner Risberg? Yes. Commissioner Perman? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner Riley? Commissioner Riley? Commissioner Hood? Yes. Commissioner DeJoy? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Ms. Hong? Yes. Commissioner Said? Yes. Commissioner Underwood? Abstain. Commissioner McMurtry? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Tegioff? Yes. Commissioner Holt. Yes. Commissioner Kantner. Abstain. Commissioner Thomas. Abstain. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. Commissioner Riley. Yes. And the chair? Yes. Sixteen with three abstentions. So the motion to initiate the study and set a public hearing date for April 30th for the homeless services uh, zoning study is approved. Commissioner Grove. All right. Our second item uh, is the parking study. So this is to release the study and its proposed tax amendments for public comment and set the public hearing also for April 30th, 2021. And I believe Tony Johnson is here with a presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. All right, so today I'm here to talk to you about the parking study and the proposed amendments, and I will try to get through this relatively quickly so that Peter has plenty of time for the next informational presentation. <clears throat> so with the study, um, right now we are proposing two options for uh, the public and the Planning Commission to consider. Um, one option would eliminate minimum parking requirements from uh, the code completely, um, and that's in Article 2 amendments. And then one option would reduce minimum parking requirements through targeted exemptions and reductions. Both options decouple bike parking requirements from vehicular parking requirements. Both options propose amendments to the Travel Demand Management Ordinance and introduce a new supplemental TDM guide. Both options require parking to be unbundled um, from rent or leases for residential properties. Uh, both options propose to streamline processes and standards for parking, and those amendments are found in Article 3 primarily. Um, and then there's another uh, number of other uh, amendments in other chapters, um, 60, 61, 65, and 66, uh, which are intended to complement uh, these kind of bigger ideas in the study. So there's two major goals of the study. The first one is to help implement the Climate Action Plan. 
Um, the other goal is to help implement uh, comprehensive plan policies. So the Climate Action Plan calls for carbon neutrality in St. Paul by 2050. Um, and currently 31% of St. Paul's emissions can be attributed to vehicle tra travel, um, which is primarily from uh, single occupancy vehicle trips. Uh, the other goal is to help implement policies of the comp plan, um, such as policy LU13, which calls for reducing parking overall, and policy LU14, which calls for reducing the amount of land devoted to off-street parking. Um, there's also other goals that, that can be furthered with this study, such as policy uh, H18, which calls for fostering the preservation and production of deeply affordable rental housing. So the first kind of major topic area that I want to talk to you all about is uh, about climate change and carbon emissions and how uh, our parking policies policies contribute to that. <clears throat> so one of the things that this study uh, tries to convey and get people to recognize is that the urban form and density of a city is inextricably linked to a city's carbon output per capita because of how the urban form of a city dictates travel behavior. Um, so, for example, in denser cities um, with a greater mix of uses, people are more likely to take transit or walk or bike for their trips. Um, in a lower density city that's auto-oriented, such as St. Paul, people are more likely to drive um, to meet their daily needs um, uh, and their uh, daily commutes. Um, so with these next couple of slides, I, I just want to give you guys a sense of how much we have prioritized um, the automobile and our planning decisions and public policy decisions and how that's expressed itself in our urban form of our city. So in St. Paul, we, we have roughly 631.2 acres of garage space. We have roughly uh, 2,659 acres of surface parking. And we have roughly 8,560 acres of right-of-way. Altogether, about 35.6% of St. Paul's land area is dedicated primarily to the purpose of moving and storing automobiles. Um, so if we plan for driving like we've done, um, people are going to drive. And if we create an urban form like this, it makes driving conducive and necessary for many trips. Um, and this is a, a kind of self-enforcing um, policy um, you know, which, which reinforces itself. Um, and the reason why is that parking requirements reduce density, uh, which increases the distance between land uses, uh, which makes walking, biking, and taking public, public transportation um, less viable modes of getting around. Um, and what's ironic about this is that off-street parking facilities um, ironically contribute to off-street parking demand. So by imposing parking requirements, we are contributing to off-street parking demand by uh, uh, reducing density and increasing the distance between land uses. So they're contributing to the problem that they're supposed to solve. Um, and on this slide, this illustrates, um, you know, how our parking requirements would look uh, if you, you know, built out these uses under, uh, with our current parking requirements. So a bar, for example, which is one of our uh, highest parking requirements, would result in a build out where 63% of the development's area would be used for parking um, and 37% would be used for the building that the parking serves. And the 63% number would actually be a little bit higher if you factored in um, uh, setbacks and landscaping requirements. Um, a far more uh, common parking requirement in our zoning code of one space per 400 for commercial uses uh, would result in a site build out where 39% of the development's area would be used for parking and 61% of the development's area would be used for a building. Um, so when you apply these broadly, um, uh, parking minimums uh, will oftentimes lead to an oversupply of parking. Um, and with these next couple of slides, this is uh, uh, from when we were doing the green line um development and one of the things that we did as part of that planning process was go out and get parking counts of existing developments along the green line so this menards for example um, the peaked observed parking usage was 59 percent of the total supply at this menards um, at this uh, western bank 
uh, the peak usage was also 59%. At the CVS, the peak usage was 33%. And at this auto zone, the peak usage was 44% uh, full. <clears throat> so there, there's two um, kind of main reasons why a parking requirement will often lead to an oversupply. The first reason um, and that people need to think about is that when parking minimums were originally developed, an oversupply was of parking was preferable to an undersupply. Um, so parking requirements were designed to be inherently conservative in order to accommodate potentially infrequent peak, peak demands of free, par free off-street parking. Uh, the second reason is that parking requirements are blunt instruments, which are often determined by one factor that may influence off-street parking demand, such as the square footage, square footage of a commercial use or the number of residential uses in a development. In actuality, there's numerous factors which may influence um, parking demand for any given development. Um, and these two targets are a great example uh, of showing, um, you know, how parking requirements would change uh, or how parking demand would be influenced by uh, the surrounding density and the mix of land uses. <clears throat> um, so this top target is one that I used to shop at a lot that's in Dinky Town, right? And so in Dinky Town, we have um, a lot of supporting density and a greater mix of land uses. And so this target in Dinky Town um, can be a viable business and operate with lower parking ratios because people are able to get to it in different uh, in ways other than driving. The second target that I'm showing, which which uh, is in the midway and definitely has oversupplies to parking. Um, but would need more parking than the Stinky Town um, example um, because the surrounding density and mix of uh, uses is, is lower um, in this area than in this top example. <clears throat> um, so another uh, major policy consideration um, is around housing. So parking increases the cost of housing primarily in two ways. So the first way that it increases uh, housing costs is by limiting density and uh, the production of new units. Um, so in St. Paul, well, in the Twin Cities, um, we've had a rental vacancy rate around 3.5% for many years. Um, and one of the things that we need to do to lower the cost of housing is simply produce more housing. Um, and so if we lower or eliminate parking requirements, um, that will enable increases of density uh, which will create more choice in St. Paul's housing market. The other uh, way that parking um, and parking requirements increase the cost of housing um, is because of the practice of bundling parking with the with housing costs. Um, and so what you do when you bundle uh, parking um, is you basically you hide the cost of parking um, in the cost of something else. So in the, the example of housing, um, bundling parking would uh, hide the cost of parking um, in the cost of your rent. And this is a very, uh, can be a, a very significant cost uh, depending on, um, you know, what type of parking you built and um, where, where the development would be located. Um, so take this with a grain of salt because this isn't um, St. Paul numbers, but this was from an APA article. Um, and in this, uh, their study, they estimated that Parking um, increases the cost of rent by $142 um, and estimated that this is 17% of additional costs can be attributed to parking. <clears throat> um, and, and one of the, the issues with just the simplicity um, of parking requirements and one factor that parking requirements don't account for is income levels of the residents. Um, so in this chart, I'm giving you guys a breakdown of the, the number of households that don't have a car. And if you look at our, our lowest income levels, um, so 30% AMI and less, on average, 34.3% of those families would not have a car, yet we would require parking at the same rate as a market rate development. Um, because these costs are bundled, um, parking minimums are akin to an, a regressive tax for lower income residents um, because we're requiring them to pay for parking as a part of their housing costs, even if they don't use or need um, 
you know, that parking space. They're, they're still paying for it and it increases their cost of housing. In subsidized developments, this is also a problem, um, but the problem is a little bit different, right? So with, with a subsidized development, what we're doing is we're injecting subsidy into a development to make uh, the housing affordable um, uh, for the residents that we're targeting. Um, but what will happen if we don't take into account income levels um, when we're, um, you know, mandating parking for these developments is that there's a high likelihood that parking would be oversupplied, particularly, you know, at that 30 percent level. Um, and we would be using our, our very scarce and limited housing resources uh, to build unused parking instead of housing. <clears throat> and one of the things that that I think we need to do and kind of center this on is is look at examples of 30 percent AMI units or supportive housing developments um, you know that we've actually done in St. Paul, which is pretty rare because of the amount of subsidy that we have to do. And there's two factors that that you know I want you to consider with these um, four examples that uh, I gave in my staff report. The first um, factor or uh, you know key takeaway. Uh, from the developments is the low ratios of parking to residential units and commercial square feet. Um, and also that the first floor of these developments is primarily active uses and not structured parking. So typically with most market rate developments, what you'll see now is on the first floor, a small lobby, um, and then the vast majority of it would be parking, um, which isn't feasible, um, you know, to, to if we're trying to get to these uh, uh, you know, targeted income levels uh, because of the cost of parking. <clears throat> so another kind of major policy issue to consider is economic development implications. <clears throat> so in the 2040 comp plan, um, our growth strategy is based off of this kind of nodal concept where one of the goals is to um, create uh, a city where people can meet uh, most of their daily needs within walking distance um, at these neighborhood nodes. So if, if we keep our parking requirements as they are, um, th this the, our, our overall you know goal to the, uh, in this nodal strategy um, may be impeded for uh, two big reasons. Um, so the first reason, um, is that minimum parking requirements detract from the walkability of commercial nodes and corridors. So this example that I'm showing in the top corner um, is kind of traditional urban form um, and, and a, you know, a very walkable corridor, um, which would be extremely hard to reproduce today uh, with our current parking requirements because of the amount of space um, that parking takes up. Um, another thing to consider uh, with neighborhood nodes um, is that if we're successful in the in this policy, um, it'll help lower parking demand because it will enable more short term discretionary trips to be conducted without a car uh, because you'll be able to meet your daily needs within a 20 minute uh, walk. Um, there's a couple other factors uh, that I talk about in the memo that parking requirements don't account for. Um, one of them is what we're doing right now, um, telecommuting. Um, so one of the, the lasting legacies of uh, the coronavirus might be that we may continue to have a greater portion of our workforce telecommute um, at least part of the week. And that will drastically change and already has drastically changed um, our assumptions about parking and parking demand. Um, and we need to try to account for that in this study. Um, so another kind of major policy factor that I want to quickly touch on is market value and tax revenue implications of parking requirements. Um, so policy LU6, uh, number three of the 2040 comprehensive plan calls for fostering equitable and sustainable economic growth by growing St. Paul's tax base in order to maintain and expand city services, amenities, and infrastructure. And these two examples, um, uh, kind of show uh, the, the implications of auto-oriented development versus transit-oriented development in regards to tax revenue. Um, so these uh, uh, developments, the vintage on Selby um, and this associated bank building were built around the same time within a block of each other um, on, on Snelling Avenue. And the vintage on Selby is yielding us a tax revenue 
um, output of $12.72 per square foot and is characteristic of transit-oriented development. Um, this bank, which is very characteristic of auto-oriented development with a drive-through, is yielding us a tax revenue of uh, $1.81 per square foot. So this will more efficiently help us meet policy LU63 of the 2040 comp plan. Um, so one of the big um, things, uh, you know, with, with both options and very important, uh, particularly for meeting our climate change goals, is travel demand management. So travel demand management is something um, that, that's often defined and thought about differently by different audiences. So uh, a developer might talk about TDM as kind of infrastructure things that they do within their development. Um, many of you may uh, interact with TDM um, at your workplace through their commuter benefits program. Um, however, at its core, um, TDM is focused on moving people and includes policies and programs that facilitate the reduction and redistribution of travel demand and increase efficiencies in the transportation network, ultimately facilitate, facilitating a mode shift and reducing the number of drive alone trips. Um, so this is, I, I love this picture that's in the corner. That's a great example of um, all the traffic reduction implications of TDM. And so what this picture is showing is just how much space is required to move people um, in different uh, ways. So on the right, this is how much space um, and, and traffic uh, would result from all of these people driving in a single occupancy vehicle. In the middle, middle it's showing uh, the same amount of people being moved by bikes. And on the left, it's showing the same amount of people being moved uh, within a bus. <clears throat> um, sorry. Uh, so one of the, the big reasons, you know, why it's important for us to do this and get TDM right is that if we reduce or eliminate, uh, uh, you know, minimum parking requirements, um, that in itself will, will shift you know, travel patterns over time, um, but that shift is going to be gradual. Um, and one of our goals, our policies in the comprehensive plan, policy T21, calls for reducing vehicle miles um, traveled by 40% by 2040. So we don't have a lot of time to achieve that policy goal. And one of the things that can help us achieve that is an effective um, TDM ordinance, because the whole point of TDM is to try to get people to shift modes away from um, driving in single occupancy vehicles. Um, right now, however, there is currently a number of issues with our current ordinance and our current approach. Um, one of the big issues is that creating a viable uh, TDMP, um, Travel Demand Management Plan, is complicated, it's expensive, and it requires the professional expertise of a traffic engineer or a city planner. Um, in our ordinance, we say that anyone can do it, that the property owner could do it, um, but the requirements would make that impossible because we, as part of the, the uh, TDM requirements currently, uh, we require traffic and um, parking modeling, which unless a developer was also a city planner, um, they would be uh, unlikely that it's unlikely that they would know how to do that. Um, another issue with our current ordinance and approach is that we don't have clear single occupancy vehicle trip reduction goals. Um, so there's a wide variation of, of TDMPs being submitted and approved to the city because we don't have, uh, we don't give a lot of guidance about what we should approve or what we shouldn't approve in regards to TDM. <clears throat> So uh, with this study um, under both options, um, uh, we are proposing a, a new and unique and innovative approach to handling TDM, that, which will greatly simplify it and allow us to uh, eventually apply TDM more broadly to developments. Um, so what we did with this approach is essentially we did the work um, that a developer would, would pay a planner uh, five or $10,000 to do per plan um, and we did a lot of that work up front. Um, and the way this, this works is we created a menu of options of um, you know, commonly done TDM strategies. And then each of these options are, have a point value associated with them. These point values are weighted um, based on the estimated reduction in vehicle miles traveled um, and therefore carbon output. Um, so, 
for, for both options, you know, this part of it is exactly the same. Um, but one of the big, uh, or, you know, slight but very important differences between the two options is that in the reduce minimums option, um, each of these uh, strategies would also have a parking reduction um, associated with them. And so what this does is it vastly increases the amount of voluntary reductions that exist in our zoning code. Um, and this is something, um, an idea that I'm, I'm really proud of. It's unique. No one's ever done anything um, like this before in the country. Um, but so so right now we, we currently there's three ways to uh, reduce uh, minimum parking requirements in our zoning code. You could do shared parking, shared vehicle parking and providing park bike parking. But by um, allowing a parking reduction for TDM measures, what we're doing is we're increasing the number of voluntary reductions in the code from three to 28. Um, <clears throat> And so under the reduce minimums option, um, it is possible that almost any development anywhere in the city can conceivably reduce their parking requirement to zero by taking advantage of these um, reductions. And so essentially what this approach does is it uses the parking requirement and specifically the cost of parking to incentivize more TDM measures um, in order for a developer to get that parking reduction. Um, so under both options, again, it, you know, you could get to whatever ratio or a developer could get to whatever ratio they want and the full elimination option um, we would give them that development rights up front and then the reduced minimums option um, you could reduce it through tdm um, if they had a minimum parking requirement so the second part of the reduced uh, minimums option is to introduce um, key exemptions in addition to those voluntary reductions that are being introduced through TDM. Um, so one of those is um, uh, eliminating minimums for developments that are proximate to transit, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slides. Um, another thing that we did in the reduced minimums option was exempt businesses under 3,000 square feet. So essentially the, the parking requirement uh, would start at 3,000 square feet. Um, we are estimating that this will reduce um, uh, parking requirements for existing businesses by 56% and 21% of businesses in St. Paul would no longer have a parking requirement uh, because of this reduction. Um, another thing that this uh, uh, study or this option is proposing is to exempt units that are rented or leased um, at or below 60% AMI. Um, so that helps solve the issue of affordable housing anywhere in the city. Um, another uh, thing that the study proposes is exempting structures that were built before 1955, which is about 70% of our building stock um, from, a from a parking requirement that would result from a change of use. So an example of this would be, say you wanted to go from, you know, something that was a residential unit uh, and convert it to a business. Um, that type of change would likely kick in a higher parking requirement, um, which for a lot of historic buildings that weren't designed to accommodate parking um, can create significant issues and can, you know, oftentimes prevent the development from happening or a new business from being established. Um, so with this transit exemption, I want to talk a little bit more about this one in particular because it is one of the most effective uh, reductions that is being proposed in the reduced minimums option. So currently we um, uh, eliminate minimums uh, in St. Paul in two places. One of them is downtown um, and then the other one is along the green line um, for parcels that are zoned um, traditional neighborhood uh, or T districts. <clears throat> Uh, with the proposed amendments, um, I'm proposing a, a number of key uh, key amendments to to this approach and to this section of the code. Um, so one of the the changes that I'm proposing is to not um, you know limit it to just T districts, right? So applying uh, the reduction to anything that's within a quarter mile of a uh, one of the modes of transit um, in the ordinance, um, and this is important because you know. Transit oriented development can happen in other zoning districts um, than you know, just T districts. And so this will enable that to happen. Um, 
Another big change is that uh, this amendment ties the exemption to modes of transit instead of a street. Um, so currently the way that we eliminate minimums along the green line is by um, calling out University Avenue. In, in this proposed language, uh, we, would tie, we would tie it to um, LRT, uh, bus or sorry, light rail transit, uh, bus rapid transit, um, and streetcar lines. Um, and this is a really important um, uh, piece of this um, uh, because what it will do is it will eliminate minimums over time as we build out our transit network. Um, another big uh, important piece of this language that's being proposed is that uh, we are proposing to also um, tie this exemption or apply this exemption to projects that have been approved to enter the project development phase by the Federal Transit Administration or that have a full funding commitment. <clears throat> so it, this is uh, showing what the um, initial exemption would be from transit um, and its relative effectiveness. Um, so one of the things um, that we have to consider when you know weighing these two options is that the majority of our city is zoned for single family um, and that the majority of our growth because of zoning is going to occur near transit corridors and specifically high transit corridors over time um, under the current zoning. Um, so right away, um, if, if we did just this transit exemption, um, almost 100% of parcels where we have our highest development capacity would have no minimum parking requirement. In these kind of mid buckets um, where we're going to see um, a lot of our growth kind of in neighborhoods um, and outside of downtown, um, about 30% of those parcels would be exempt right away from minimum parking requirements. Um, and the, it, one of the things that I want to highlight um, and that you'll see on this on this um, is that the B line um, is shown and the exemption would apply to the B line right away because it has a uh, full funding commitment. Um, so that's the uh, bus rapid transit line that's gonna go along Marshall and then along Selby Avenue. Um, and, and as I previously stated, uh, the way this works and, be, and by tying it to transit, um, this would increase the amount of parcels uh, that have no minimum parking requirements over time as we build out our transit network. Um, so what this slide is showing is the currently approved uh, Met Council uh, high capacity transit or high frequency transit network for St. Paul. Um, and if we uh, fully built out our network under this scenario, um, these numbers in these two middle buckets would increase uh, about 25% or about 20% for, for um, parcels uh, not having a, a minimum parking requirement. Um, and if we built out um, this network, which is what um, our planning team is advocating for and trying to push for, um, the, the network next tra or, uh, uh, transit network, um, this option or this uh, transit build out would eliminate minimums for the majority of parcels uh, where we currently have the capacity for our city to grow. Um, and so that's all I have today. Um, and so right here, I, I have a, a parking study email set up. Um, and then again, today, what the, the action that we're requesting um, is that you release this study for public review and schedule uh, a public hearing for April 30th. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Tony on his presentation? Uh, Commissioner Cantor? Cantor? Yeah, and um, excuse me if this is not the right time to ask this sort of question. Um, but uh, first of all, Tony, great, great job. This is an amazing study. Um, I just wanted to um, ask quickly about the parking maximum. Um, I think that was near the end of the study. Um, and just wondering, it looks like um, you were proposing just adopting kind of the parking maximums that were already in place. And I wondered if there was any consideration of maybe lowering those maximums or kind of what thought went into that. <laughs> yeah, so so we've actually, we've had a lot of uh, 
discussions about that at the committee level. Um, the reason why I didn't do that is I wasn't directed to in my initial scope. Um, and my, my scope got expanded um, uh, as I was going along with this study. Um, and, and so doing something like that is something that I wouldn't want to rush um, because of the, the market implications and, and the um, uh, process implications of us doing that and getting it wrong. Um, so in our code right now, we, you know, we have our maximums and then there's a way to go over the maximums uh, with a conditional use permit. Um, and one of the things that I'm nervous about um, is if we get too aggressive with it and we don't take time to consider it and look at different scenarios um, with it, uh, we might uh, accidentally, you know, uh, make ourselves uh, have to do conditional use permits every week for parking. Um, instead of focusing on, you know, some of the other studies that have been initiated recently. Um, so what I would recommend is that if we want to look at maximums, I would recommend initiating a separate study um, just to deal with that issue. Oh, and one thing, one thing I should say uh, too that I forgot to mention um, is, is one of the things that we did through um, TDM is we created um, an incentive to um, uh, lower your, your parking ratios. Um, so, you know, with the TDM program, I explained that we, we set a point target for kind of each uh, development. There's points associated with each strategy. Um, and one of the things uh, with the point target is if you build more parking, um, it's going to increase your, your point target um, and therefore more TDM stuff. And then if you reduce uh, your parking ratios, um, the TDM program will lower the, the point target for your development. Um, so that creates kind of an incentive to build lower parking ratios. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Grill, uh, would there be anything you'd like to add about the discussions that were had at the committee level regarding that question? Um, I mean, I think Tony covered it pretty succinctly and, and chair feel free to to comment if you have additional items um but we we did discuss maximums um a few times we've been meeting on this weekly for uh several weeks now and there was a lot of conversation around maximums and could they be included in scope um and i think uh we voted it out of committee and and to come to the full planning commission um sort of with the expectation that there might be public comment or other items that come come into play, um, but that it, it wasn't um, it wasn't included as part of scope. And, and Chair, feel free to um, add any other additional items to that. To the question about the maximums and coming out of committee, I think it was, the reason I voted to just send it out for public input was to see kind of the interest uh, around all the issues that we discussed at committee level. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around the bundling, at least that I brought up a lot of discussion about um, the parking maximums and then just other issues. Um, and I think the the general feeling was put it out there, see what comes back at public hearing and what other commissioners think about these issues, and then we'll come back to committee with this broader, uh, I guess, input from all commissioners and community members and continue the discussions that we had at committee. Uh, I see that Commissioner Hood had a question, but uh, Ms. Mohan, is there something that you'd like to add about this particular issue before I call on Commissioner Hood? Sure, I just wanted to add a little bit also to the parking maximum conversation. Um, beyond just like having it be a different study, I, I don't want to forget our colleagues at Public Works. So I think, you know, there there will be some concern um, also with this study on what happens to um, parking that is not related to development projects and sort of how do we manage the curb and what are the best ways to manage the curb. And the zoning code is like one place where we can do that at the city, but there are other tools that may make sense where we would want to partner um, with different departments. So, and that that could, be a part of a different study that also looks at um, parking maximum. So it's it's not always just the zoning code that's a tool to manage parking. Thank you, Ms. Mohan, Commissioner Hood, and then Commissioner Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a 
Tony, I have a question on our current policy at the city level. How do we currently determine whether or not a traffic study or TDMP, travel demand management plan, is required for a particular development? Is Are there any size restrictions or is it based on staff discretion? And I know that you had mentioned um, uh, various uh, requirements moving forward that are proposed that would say, yes, at this particular level or this particular building size, we would require them. But do we have anything like that currently? Thank you. Yeah, so, so um, it, it's kind of both. Um, so with the with the TDM and, and the traffic modeling and parking modeling that's associated with that, it's kicked in at uh, 100 parking spaces, I believe, off the top of my head, and then I think 50 spaces on the green line. Um, and so it's kicked in as, as part of TDM at that threshold. Um, as part of the, the ordinance amendments in TDM, um, I'm proposing to uh, stop basing the threshold off of parking and instead basing it off the size of development. Um, so under the uh, proposed ordinance language, the th new threshold for TDM would be uh, 25 units or 20,000 square feet of a non-residential unit. Um, and then why I say it's both is there's another section of the code um, in site plan review um, where the traffic engineer could request a uh, traffic and parking study, and there isn't a threshold for that. They could request it for any development that they think um, it's necessary uh, to have it for. Thank you. And one other follow-up question. Has there been any discussion in committee or among staff about basing it um, on the specific type of land use? For example, um, let's just take a Starbucks drive through, for example, whereas that may be a small building for a traffic study, but uh, it, it's a land use that has seems to be proven has caused uh, a little bit of backups, I think, to say it politely, uh, versus for example, you may have a larger residential unit that might be within a downtown area that would likely not generate any traffic. Is it, so that was that would just be an example. So is there any uh, is there any discussion on specific land use or building typologies that would, uh, let's just say, trigger a TDMP or a traffic study uh, where others would not? Yeah, well, so. No, no and, and yes. Uh, so in regards to your, your kind of first um, you know, question about Starbucks and the traffic study, so that, that's something that the site plan um, you know, review ordinance could cover. So the traffic engineer could, and I think probably did, request a traffic and parking study um, uh, for that development. Um, in regards to TDM, which is now being totally split out from that process and doing traffic studies and traffic modeling. Um, there is considerations to um, geographies and then also uh, to general land uses, which um, are grouped together based off of their travel characteristics. Um, so for example, in, in downtown, um, we would require more points um, for your TDM plans because TDM will be more effective in downtown. And then outside of, and then on transit uh, corridors, uh, we require less than downtown, but more than everywhere else. And then everywhere else where there isn't kind of good access to high capacity transit, um, they get a lower uh, point threshold to start with. Um, and then that point target, uh, again, can be adjusted based off of their parking ratio. So if you build a lot of parking, um, the way we're trying to disincentivize that is by requiring more TDM. If you build less parking, um, you'd have less um, TDM stuff to do. If that makes sense. And I can pull up the guide if you want me to kind of show that and how that works as well. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Mitchell. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of questions one, or comments. Um, this is very technical. And when this goes out to pub for public hearing, how will the just a regular layman be able to understand the implications of such 
you know, uh, uh, some changes. So that's one of my questions. How will you bring this down a bit so other people in community can understand this? And two, are we considering workforce development? Because when you think about low-income families and transportation, they need cars to go outside of St. Paul, Minneapolis. That has been the case because we don't have a great trans transportation system for the buses. Has that been considered in um, some discussions with workforce development? Uh, and how this is going to impact low-income families. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so for your the first part of your question, um, we are working on kind of a more um, uh, general and, and simpler uh, presentation for some webinars that uh, we will be giving in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, and one of the things that, that we're doing with that uh, presentation is kind of breaking um, the big ideas into to kind of characters. So we have like a character that's a renter, a homeowner, a business owner, and then trying to kind of explain in simple terms what these changes mean to you. Um, in regards to your, your second question, um, that wasn't something um, that I would say is, it was considered kind of as a separate thing with, with this study at all. Um, so is it something to be considered? Because again, when we're thinking about uh, changing how people go to work and low income mm -hmm. families and individuals uh, may have not have a choice, but to get a car yep. Yep. To the, um, to the out. So I'm just wondering, has that been considered and can we consider it in your presentation so that we have a better idea about how this impacts low income families and workforce development? Yeah, I mean, I can, yeah, try to, think about uh, ways to to address that. I mean, I mean, one thing I'll say kind of generally and something that we need to do and something that our comp plan calls for um, is, is with the neighborhood nodes, you know, strategy, for example, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is make make sure that you people can reach their daily needs within a 20 minute walking distance. And so if we're increasing, you know, residential and commercial density in the core cities, um, that's going to increase, you know, the number of jobs that are available within the city and on transit corridors where, you know, we have our highest uh, density growth and where growth is going to occur in St. Paul is, is near transit corridor. Some people will be able to get get to work on um, transit. So I'll, I'll have to try to think if there's a, a way I can kind of make that point and plug that in. Uh, just one more comment is just that. Uh, the research set shows that that's not the case. So I'm just want. I mean, that is truly not the case for low-income people who get the jobs within their uh, in their communities. That is not the research um, that has been found to be happening. So I just want you to know that, and that's my last comment. Yep, yep, and I and I I understand that that is it's probably not true for right now, but that that's one of the goals of the comp plan and one of the things that we're trying to do over time, uh, right? So. You know, we're trying to increase job density within the city. We're trying to increase housing density within the city, and and so I'm I'm hoping that that will result in um, more jobs being available for people within their communities um, that's closer to their houses. So hopefully, we don't get you know Amazon and Shakopee again <laughs> if we create opportunities for you know different businesses to come in. And one of the ways to do that is. Uh, to lower or reduce minimum parking requirements because that's uh, you know if, if you one of the things that I think you'll you, you'll see well I suppose if we do this you wouldn't see it but one of the the things that that uh, a lot of people don't realize I think with development um, and density is that parking requirements are one of the biggest limiting factors to any development like that I, oftentimes like the density that we set the maximum def density that we set matters. Um, but a lot of times what's actually going to set the maximum density is the parking requirement and trying to accommodate that parking because of the amount of space it takes up. Thank you for that comment. I see Commissioner Holt has a question, but before calling on him, Tony, I'd, I'd, I'd ask that you consider uh, Commissioner Mitchell's uh, question, uh, which I think was really well stated around the issue of unbundling, because the impression that I got at the end of our committee meeting, um, and I and I voiced this was that that unbundling is going to 
uh, have a disproportionate impact on lower communities, uh, lower income communities, which tend to be communities of color, as we all know. So I would just ask that that question um, when it comes back to committee, if you can have more information uh, with regards to the unbundling and the the way that Commissioner uh, Mitchell posed it. Uh, I mean, would go ahead. Would sending kind of reports, academic reports, be enough to show how it increases housing costs? Well, I think the the question that Commissioner Mitchell posed is how uh, lower. I understand that it might lower costs, and and I think your presentation was really clear on that. Uh, well, not lower costs. That parking is a large, is a a huge, is a large component of the cost of a housing unit, mm -hmm. whether or not that is passed down to a consumer or a, a tenant by unbundling the cost savings is a question one that that exists but then two the question that commissioner mitchell um posed and i think it's a larger it's a another question is um individuals who don't live in these transit corridors uh that need a car and that therefore if you unbundle and are therefore disincentivizing by having a car are kind of at a lose-lose situation so I just ask that you consider the question that she posed around that issue of unbundling um, and, and maybe uh, provide more information on that. Um, sure, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, do some updates. Commissioner Holst and then Commissioner Grill. Um, hello, Chair, thank you. Uh, Tony, I, I guess I was wondering if you had any projections on um, the reduced parking minimums versus the eliminating parking minimums. I mean, I, clearly both will would uh, we would think re reduce parking surface area, but um, I, I couldn't find it in here. And if it is, maybe just direct me to the right part of the study that maybe make some projections about what it might look like in 2040 and how likely it would be to, to meet goals under one model versus the other. Um, sure, so if I can pull up the memo real quick. Um, I'll show you where I, I kind of tried to compare the two options or give highlights about what they might mean and you know where one might be more effective for certain things than, than other things. And so at the end of the intro um, on page kind of 22 to uh, 25, I give kind of an overview of you know the big ideas in both studies um, and then you know try to give just a very quick and succinct um, highlight of like what that might do. I, I don't have any specific um, uh, kind of things of, of how this will affect development over time or, or putting a specific date on it. Um, one of the things that I do though in this section um, right here is kind of, uh, you know, talk about um, parking production and, and what you know has happened um, in the past and comparing uh, parking ratios outside of areas where we've eliminated them um, and then parking ratios um, you know everywhere else where we have a parking requirement um, and one of the things that we've seen in the last two years is that and this kind of goes to I think Commissioner Mitchell's question as well um, is that on average um, New development in downtown or near University Avenue, so places where we don't have parking uh, requirements, mm -hmm. reduce their parking by 30.5%, uh, uh, less than what have been required by code. But no one built anything without, um, you know, any parking or anything like that. Uh, we we don't have that market yet. I think um, for development to be financed without any parking, you know, maybe in downtown that, that might happen, but everywhere else it's. It, Highly unlikely, um, in my opinion, that a development would get financed without providing any parking. Um, and there's also, I mean, there's market reasons why you wouldn't want to to build something without any parking. Um, parking is still, you know, one of the main amenities that people look for when choosing housing. Um, and so that's uh, something that's likely going to be true and continue to be true um, until we build out our transit network and make it possible to get to more places, um, you know, via high capacity transit. So. Thank you. Commissioner Grill. 
Um, I think I, uh, my issues, I think have been covered, I think by everyone at this point, I think um, when we get to the public presentation point, clarifying the differences between the TDM plan, the full elimination option, um, and then how it is not um, maximums, I think would also be helpful. Just all of us going through several weeks of, of reviewing the plan, I think it was really clear how confusing even even we found it. And that's no fault of Tony's. It's just a really complicated topic. Um, so I think any of those places where we can simplify um, the, the the big points. And I know, T Tony, you've done a good job in the presentations, but um, it's easy to get bogged down um, in the report. So uh, I think it was an excellent presentation um, and appreciate all the work that you have done and, and every time we have uh, increased the scope for you. Um, so, so thank you for that. But yeah, that was my only one note. All right, thanks for those comments. Any additional questions for Tony or staff? Seeing none, uh, Commissioner Grow, I'd be looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Commission release the zoning study and proposed amendments for public review and schedule a public hearing for April 30th, 2021. All right, motion made by Commissioner Grill. Is there a second? Seconded, <laughs> Commissioner Hood. So motion by Commissioner Grill, second by Commissioner Hood. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any discussion? I have a question because we have oh. some questions. Go ahead, so, Commissioner. <laughs> so we brought up some questions. So about how he's going to, to release it. Is he going to release it? I think there's some conditions about releasing this because we have to be able to, the community has to be able to understand it. Sure. So, um, so is that not part of the condition? We're going to release it as is. It is. It would be as, as it currently was sent out to all the commissioners okay. uh, with the understanding that Mr. Johnson is preparing additional presentations to give to the community in more layperson terms. Okay, so should that be part of our motion or not? I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure I understand how it's going to go out to community. Sure. So I think what you would be proposing then uh, is there any additional, is there a particular thing that you would be asking as a condition that you could offer as a friendly amendment to Commissioner Grill? My, I guess my, my amendment is that it will go out in um, different, I'm, I have to think about how I want to word this, um, in different terms so that community is under understands it better i because i can't support it the way it's written okay i see uh director Pereira has a, a comment and then i'll come back to you is that okay commissioner mitchell because it might be uh clarifying your what you're trying to articulate yeah thank you all right uh, director Pereira. chair and uh Commissioner Mitchell and others, um, we uh, so actually um, Medica Mohan and Tony Johnson uh, have been working really hard on. I think we alluded to a couple of presentations for the community. Uh, we've also involved our our communications professional who is who is not a planner. She uh, she's challenged us to to not speak in in terms that you know only planners understand on this issue. Um, uh, so I just wanted to comment a few things and then I wanted to recognize uh, uh, or ask it that if we could uh, allow Menica Mohan to, to speak a little bit more about the plans chair. Um, we have we do have a website as well as a um, an email address for uh, for questions um, for the community. Um, and on the website we have um, some some information about about the process. Uh, we hope to continue to populate that with um, frequently asked questions and things like that, uh, as well as some additional communication materials to help get the word out to the community, both residents and businesses. 
Um, so uh, it, if I might, uh, if you'd be comfortable um, recognizing Menica and she could comment a little bit more about the plan for uh, getting getting the message and, and uh, the information out in a, in a format that works for folks. Ms. Bohan. Uh, thank you, Chair. So through the Chair, um, this is Menica, planning staff. Uh, I've been working with um, Tony and then some consultants on two public webinars that we will be hosting if you set the date for the public hearing on April 15th in the evening and then April 20th during lunchtime um, to provide a sort of a brief overview in general what the parking regulations are trying to do. Um, basically, as what Tony said, through different stories of a renter, a homeowner, um, a developer, um, and a city person uh, that sort of explain the options in more layperson terms. Uh, and so that that is our strategy. We also um, are releasing it today uh, for April 30th, which is generally more than the 30 days that we allow. And we also have um, a email address and a website. Um, and if the study is released today, uh, there'll be a form on the website that uh, folks will be able to use to submit their public comment. Thank you, Ms. Mohan, and uh, I see Mr. Johnson, and then I'll, I'll make a comment and I'll come back to Ms. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell. Um, yeah, so in the um, appendix in the report, um, one of the things that we did um, for the committee for the last meeting was created kind of an executive summary chart of the amendments. Um, so if I can pull it up real quick. Um, you know, it's a long study and part of the reason why it's long is because there's two options. Um, so I created this chart to kind of very simply say what each amendment uh, would do um, and then for what option uh, it would go with. So something to maybe check out to review the amendments if you don't want to read the full, the full thing. So. Thank you, Tony. Um, so I, I just want to say, Commissioner Rich, I, I appreciate you making this point because it does bring back the focus um, to the implications that, uh, on the individuals that it will that it will impact. Um, and I and I do think that there is. I, I do think that as as Commissioner as Commissioner Grill stated, we kind of when we when we were going through this, we get so bogged down in the intricacies of the document itself. Um, that we sort of assume this role that we almost uh, are, are speaking for everybody and, and can sort of protect everybody when in reality, community in and of itself should be able to advocate for itself. And so I appreciate your comment um, because it, it does get a little problematic for me when we begin to assume that role that we know what's best for community. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll come back to you and see where you're at having heard uh, Director Pereira's, Ms. Mohan's, and Mr. Johnson's uh, clarifications. Is there another? I thought I had saw some hands. <laughs> but. I, think, I think it's back to you. OK, so this is my thoughts. Um, because of the district councils, I think that um, somehow, again, we have to understand that, you know, yes, we're in COVID-19. Yes, we we do technology. Yes, we do. But many people in community do not and do not access computers and putting things on websites just don't work. And so if we really want to have community input and engagement, there's got to be a different way than just website. I'm just going to recommend that I'm okay with the April 30th, I'm okay with that. Yet I do would like for them to engage with the district councils. Um, so that would be one way to get community input is to engage with district councils. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I wanna um, echo what Commissioner Mitchell just shared. I, I think one of the benefits to um, releasing this to public hearing is it does allow the city staff to go out um, and communicate with uh, 
folks in community, and I, I really appreciate um, Commissioner Mitchell's suggestion, um, and I, I would support that. I think it gives, you know, there's like six weeks between now and, and April 30th, and it would be um, nice to talk to um, the district councils, as well as the existing partnership with Move Minnesota, which has, you know, folks in community already built, sort of baked in to that, um, and figure out some really great strategies to, um, get to people where they are as, um, you know, sort of vaccination numbers increase. Um, outside is still relatively safe. The weather is getting much nicer, we can only hope. Um, so uh, yeah, I really, I really like that idea. I don't know if we can add it to a motion, but um, it also might be nice to get an update in two or four weeks um, from staff, uh, sort of how that's going um, as sort of an accountability measure. Um, and I'm really impressed with the study, by the way. This is a incredible work. Um, so thank you for that. And thanks for the time, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Riley. So I'm, I'm hearing uh, two different things. One from Commissioner Mitchell about outreaching to uh, district, uh, well, to, to, to the, uh, just outreaching to the community. And then I'm hearing from Commissioner Riley to come back in four weeks or sometime before the public hearing to kind of give us an update on it. Uh, but I'm not hearing a motion or asking for a motion or, or a friendly amendment to Commissioner Grill. So is there a friendly amendment? I thought I did. <laughs> I have a friendly amendment that we reach out to one, the district councils and the community in regard to this plan before April 30th. All right. Uh, so, Commissioner Grill, I'll come back to you. Would you be willing to accept that as a friendly amendment? I would. I, I would like to know if, if staff's comfortable or that they have, if they're able to. Um, I, I just don't want to set something that they're that they're just not going to be able to do in the time frame. Um, but as, if I don't hear anything else from staff, um, then yes, I would accept the amendment. So, if there's any comments from staff before I accept it. Director Prayer, or sorry, Chair. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, uh, Luis. Yeah, I'm just uh, chatting here with uh, the team. Um, we have been talking to Move Minnesota, so that's that's a great idea to continue to work with them as a partner, and maybe there's some creative other forms of engagement. Um, we have been working uh, with our plan uh, to engage with district councils. Um, I believe all of them are meeting online today. Um, you know, whether there's some partnerships to do some outdoor type, uh, you know, sessions or things like that, pop ups. Uh, maybe there's there's something we can add into that mix, but but I think we can um, explore it. But uh, we just want to set expectations that, you know, there there's. We, uh, you know, other the, the organizations in the community are are doing things online as well. And so we're just we, we uh, we're working with them and kind of obviously um, Constraints are, you know, vaccines and uh, and the weather, uh, but certainly we'll we'll do our best. And 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 I would invite Medic or Tony to to add to that if you've got other things in your mind. Uh, assuming you're okay with that, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Tony or Medica. Uh, that, yeah, I don't have anything to add. Do our do our best to get it out there. Uh, actually, I guess I'll add one thing. So we we I have done um, yeah. some engagement at district councils prior to getting to this point. Um, so uh, I went to, very early on. I went to some on the A line before we were even um, considering full elimination, uh, just to talk about kind of that transit exemption. Um, I've been to uh, Summit Hill a number of times because um, of their parking concerns along Grand Avenue. Um, and then we recently did uh, another informational presentation to Sustain St. Paul. Um, so we will continue to try to get the word out and get people um, to you know, know what's going on and to help them provide um, useful comments for us to review and consider with this stuff. Anyone else from staff? <coughs> All right, so I'll come back to Commissioner Grill. Having heard that, Commissioner Grill, are you okay accepting that as a friendly amendment? 
So, um, Commissioner Mitchell, are you, uh, if I say that staff will explore additional opportunities for community engagement um, and engagement with the district councils, uh, is that, are you comfortable with that? And, and report back to us, because I'm on a district council and we have not heard this. So I'm just, and I'm a district council uh, summit you. So I just want to make sure that, um, that they give us a report back. Okay. Um, so chair, I'd like to amend the, uh, sorry, I'd like to amend the motion um, to include uh, that staff uh, explore additional community engagement opportunities and engagement with the district councils um, and report back to the full planning commission um, before the public hearing. Okay. Uh, and I think uh, Commissioner Riley just noted that the reporting back is important to him as well. So. Uh, would there be a, a specific date or weeks before uh, Commissioner Girl, or would you just leave it up to staff? I think because they have to deal with the scheduling and planning aspect um, and, and they have a month, I, I think I would leave that to staff to give us the date um, okay. as long as it's before the public hearing. So the, the motion now um, is, I don't think, do, do, do I need to take a second on that or is it because it's a friendly amendment? Commissioner Hood, are you okay with that as well? I am okay with that. All right, so the, the motion then is, let me bring my agenda back up. Uh, the motion now then is to release this, the parking study uh, with its proposed text amendment for public comment and set a public hearing for April 30th, 2021 with the additional condition that staff explore additional community engagement with district councils and community uh, and report back before the April 30th date on the engagement that has occurred. Is there any discussion, additional discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Sonia, can we get a roll call? Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner DeJoy? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Commissioner McMurtry? Yes. Commissioner Saeed? Yes. Commissioner Perryman. Yes. Commissioner Hong. <clears throat> yes. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Epstein. Commissioner Chill. Yes. Commissioner Kantner. Yes. Commissioner Holst. Yes. Commissioner Risberg. Yes. Commissioner Riley. Yes. Commissioner Tagioff. Yes. And the chair. Yes. Commissioner Anderson and I'm voting yes. Pardon me? This is Commissioner Anderson and I'm voting yes. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I missed you. I said that. Okay, I'm sorry. So that's 17 and one abstention. So the, the motion carries uh, to release the study with its with the additional condition um, or two conditions. The next item on the agenda is a presentation uh, by Luis and our legal counsel, Peter Warner, it will be also available for questions, I believe. Uh, regarding the Planning Commission authorities. So I'm just gonna provide a, a brief uh, background on how we got to this point, and also to sort of set the expectations of, of, uh, of what we can do going forward. Um, so th uh, throughout my time in the Planning Commission, and I think anybody who has been in the commission for as long as I have, uh, or longer, um, uh, we have constantly been struggling with the issue of housing affordability within the city of St. Paul, uh, the equity issues regarding uh, including all community members and making the city a livable place for everyone. Um, 
And so we've uh, throughout we've had a lot of discussions over and over again, uh, specifically when major developments, which by all accounts are beautiful developments, uh, are being erected across the city that are market rate apartments and in a way price out a lot of members of the of our community of St. Paul. Um, and there's been ongoing discussion about what, how, what and how the commission can do to sort of um, have either requirements or uh, impose conditions on developers to sort of have this broader consideration for those lower economic uh, individuals of our city uh, and, you know, uh, including everybody. And it, it always turns into a discussion about what we can and can't do, um, the tools that we do and do not have available, the, the methods by which we can achieve these goals. And um, that this, this ongoing debate about this issue kind of culminated for the new commissioners, uh, not just the new five ones that came in, but also the, the ones that were sworn in last month kind of culminated uh, with a with a discussion during a, a project that we voted on uh, a few months ago, and the subsequent presentation by Director Pereira on the projects that are in place for the upcoming year, and sort of the the absence of what uh, is known as the inclusionary zoning study, uh, which is this idea that um, if I can summarize it correct, uh, if I may be summarizing it incorrectly, but my understanding of it is, is that there would be a regulation in the city that would, uh, or there would be an exploration about whether a regulation would be appropriate uh, in which developers would be required to incorporate affordable housing within, uh, within their projects. Um, we had some discussions at, at zoning committee a few years back, and we explored that question a little bit. Uh, and we kind of got a, I believe one of the commissioners sent out a email uh, with numerous cities around St. Paul that already have inclusionary zoning incorporated within their code. Um, and then sort of uh, COVID happened, uh, you know, the resources of staff are limited. Uh, so we have other projects, other studies that are being done by the city that that seek to meet the goals as well. Um, and so uh, we have been having this discussion about what the authority of the commission is, and I believe that's what where we're here to do today. Luis? Yes, Chair. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of ask a, a question. Um, we have a presentation prepared uh, Peter Warner from the city attorney's office and I, uh, but also wanted to respect your time. And I know Peter has some limited time here. So um, it is a bit of a lengthy presentation, uh, a lot of legalese. Um, we can try to run through it quickly. Um, we could uh, defer it to next time. Um, we could send it in advance and then talk about it next time. We could, I, I just wanted to see what, uh, sort of the temperature is for jumping into it uh, now, given that we've had quite a, quite a meeting already. Uh, thank you for asking. Thank you for uh, asking about that, Louis. So uh, I will also add that um, st the steering committee meets before the planning commission, and we have been having ongoing discussions regarding this presentation and what we can do. Um, and those discussions are still ongoing. Um, so we can, we could definitely continue this presentation to the next planning commission um, when hopefully we have a more concrete idea of uh, and have more options available for the commission at that time. I see Commissioner Grill has her hand raised, but I would also uh, see if um, people would be willing, we can take a vote um, on whether, because I do understand we, we're already been here for two hours. Um, and. Uh, we can take a vote on whether to hear this today or wait till the next planning commission meeting uh, when we can uh, have the presentation as well. So, Commissioner Grill. 
I was just going to ask if you needed a motion for that because um, I want to see and hear your whole presentation, but I'm going to have to leave soon. And I'm imagining there's a lot of people in that boat as well. Um, so if you need a motion, I would make a motion that we delay this to the next planning commission meeting. I see Commissioner Baker has his hand raised and, and I'll come back to you, Commissioner Grill. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair. I would agree with Commissioner Grill. And one of my uh, requests is if we uh, motion, there is a motion and it's approved to move this over to another meeting that we, it's possible that we can move this up at the beginning or towards the beginning of a meeting. Yes, and just looking at the agenda, I would ask that this be put on the next planning commission meeting, which would be on April 2nd. And, and that we do address it um, earlier on the agenda as well. So would Commissioner Baker or Commissioner Grill be willing to make a motion and then we can take a vote and see where everybody else is in terms of time. And, and then I'll come to Commissioner McMurtry uh, in a second here. Uh, I will motion um, All right. for this presentation. So the motion is to delay the presentation to the next planning commission meeting, Commissioner Baker? That is correct. Okay. Is there a second on the motion? Okay, great. Commissioner McMurtry. Uh, motion yeah. by, by Commissioner Baker, seconded by Commissioner Grill. Commissioner McMurtry. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is something that needs to be added, but I know that it was offered that we could get it before as a as a pre-read, and I wanted to make sure we could could still um, have that opportunity before the uh, we see the presentation at the next meeting. And I, I think uh, Director Pereira can send it out. Uh, he, he did say that he could do that. Commissioner Risberg? Yes, I, um, I agree with the motion, um, but I did want to check in with Mr. Warner or, um, to make sure he's available on April 2nd. Thank you for that, Commissioner Risberg. Uh, uh, Mr. Warner, would you be available on April 2nd for the presentation? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, commissioners, yes, I will be available that morning. I'm leaving that afternoon, but uh, to go out of town. But uh, that morning, I'm happy to be here. Right. Any additional questions or discussion on the motion? Sonia, can we get a roll call? Okay, Commissioner Risberg? Yes. Commissioner Perryman? Yes. Commissioner Riley? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Commissioner DeJoy? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Hong? Yes. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Kenner. Yes. Commissioner McMurtry. Yes. Commissioner Said. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Tagioff. Yes. Commissioner Holst. Yes. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Chair. Yes. Unanimous. So the Planning Commission Authority's presentation will be laid over till the next Planning Commission. And if we could, uh, Luis, just uh, maybe put it before the Comp Plan and Neighborhood Planning Committee um, issue uh, or agenda item. Moving on to the Transportation Committee, Commissioner Risberg. Yes, thank you. Um, just quickly, our next meeting is um, of the Transportation Committee is this coming Monday, March 22nd from 4.30 to 6. We have two items on the agenda. The first is uh, a informational presentation on the Metro B Line Bus Rapid Transit project. Um, and Adam Smith from Metro Transit will be talking to us. And the second is the Minnehaha Avenue and Stillwater Road resurfacing project. And uh, Faye Semmer of MnDOT um, will be talking to us as well. So I encourage uh, anybody who's interested in these projects to please uh, join us. That concludes my report. 
Thank you, Commissioner Rithberg. Moving on to communications and nominations, Commissioner Underwood. Uh, Chair, she left a message. Um, she had to leave out. She had. She said she didn't have a report out. Okay. So then, moving on to the next item, uh, task force and liaison reports, Commissioner DeJoy. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Ronghill uh, Morales. The Community Advisory Committee um, held an online community meeting on March 16th when we reviewed the finalist scenarios presented by the Cunningham Group. We had 150 people from the general public in attendance and about um, up to 16 other folks um, from uh, the Port Authority and PED and um, on the committee. We're still seeking input about the master plan scenarios and uh, the draft housing policy. And to review those, I did post in the chat the link um, to visit the Hillcrest master planning. There is a survey that um, we're encouraging folks to take it, the survey is at that on that um, web page, and we're hoping to get the surveys completed by April 16th. Uh, and you can also add comments in the ideas board that's also accessible through that link. And one other thing I'd like to mention is that the Eastside Freedom Library held a public meeting as well. Um, 20 people were in attendance. It was entitled What's Going On at Hillcrest, Part 1. And um, so there was great input as well. And I noticed that some of the same people that attended that meeting did attend um, our community advisory um, online meeting on the 16th. So um, that's my report. Thank you, Commissioner DeJoy. And uh, I'll call on Commissioner Grill. Any report on your task force um so the stationary task force for riverview um, has not met yet i believe uh, the names of the members of the committee will be formally um shared in april at which time uh, meetings will start to be scheduled Great. thank you commissioner grill uh, so i'll move on to old business and then new business and i know um we're really late, but if there's any new business that people would like to add to the agenda uh, for the next planning commission meeting, you can say it now. Okay, uh, so then we will adjourn the March 19, 2021 St. Paul Planning Commission meeting. Thanks everybody for joining and thanks everybody for your time and discussion and input today. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the new members. Thank you.